If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Galatians chapter 4, I'm going to start there. It's fascinating that our the God of the universe has chosen to make life a process that starts from something so small and fragile. Yes. Packed with all the potential right there, like in a seed, all the DNA in a seed. Everything to make the oak tree is in the seed. There's a statement in the fellowship hall. Men can count how many seeds are in an apple, but God can count how many apples are in a seed. <laughs> you know, that's a, it's amazing what He is able to do. But he, He's designed life that it's a progression from an infant to maturity, from something that's incomplete to complete. And there is a spiritual progression, a spiritual development that I want to make sure we understand. What are we supposed to grow into spiritually? What does it mean to grow from an infant in Christ, freshly and newly born again, to someone who's mature, full of the Holy Spirit, complete in Christ? Well, let's, let's look at this process. Paul actually spells it out for us here in his letter to the church there in Galatia. Still starting in chapter 4, verse 1. Follow me. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child and, or an infant, the word here is napios in the Greek. It means so small that you're not trained. A child uh, from, a, from a tiny baby to, to before really training begins. It's also translated as simple. In the Old Testament, it's often used as the simple. The Lord gives understanding to the simple, to the napios, to those who aren't trained. But as long as the heir is still an untrained child, he does not differ at all from a slave, though he is owner of everything. But he's under guardians and stewards until the date set by the father. Now, this was something that was in Roman culture. Until you were 14 years old, you were under tutors and guardians. It's not necessarily two different positions. Paul is just stating that you were under someone else's authority than directly answering to the father. Oftentimes the father was either in military service or he had to be out away on business. And so he assigned someone else to have authority as a guardian over that child until it was fully trained. That's what Paul, and this is what Paul's alluding to. And so he tells us, he draws the analogy for the believer. So also we... While we were still untrained, while we were the napios, while we were the untaught ones, when our understanding was not developed, we were enslaved under the basic principles of the world. The basic element. This is right. This is wrong. This is good. That's bad. The basic principles. The things that make life work. Do this. Don't do that. You should do this. Do not do that. The basic elements. All of us, while we were untrained, infants, immature, that's what we were placed under. The basic elements of the world. But look at verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that He might redeem those who were under the law. So God sent forth Jesus to buy us back from out of being under the law. Do you realize God doesn't want you under the law? He doesn't want you under those basic elements. You were enslaved by them when you didn't know any better. But that's why we just use this word often to those children before they really understand anything. We use the word no, don't, stop. And often we just tell them, come, do this, do that. We don't try to explain it to them. We just, we command them. They're under that authority. But when God sent forth His Son, He had something better for us than simply being under basic law, basic principles. This is right, this is wrong. He came to actually buy us out of that condition. Verse 5, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, we don't understand what Paul wrote here, this word adoption, because it's not used 
today the way they used it back then. It's a similar idea. But then a natural born son went through a, a status called the adoption. Weosthesis in the Greek. It's a stated son where the father declared, this is my son. And he's no longer under the tutor. It was a state where the father said he's learned enough. Usually in the Roman culture, it was about age 14. Where the father would say, you're not under the tutor anymore. Now they were still sometimes under an additional guardian up into the age 25 if you study history. But when, when the, the weos thesis, the stated son, is a declaration of the full rights being conferred on the son of the father. And it's almost like saying, my son is equal to me. His name has, carries the same authority as mine. His word is to be he heeded just as mine. It's a statement the father declares a son. So we, he, he sent for Jesus, he's saying, while the world in general, you and I were under the basic principles of what's right, what's wrong. Do this, do that. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. Those basic principles. He sent his son to redeem us out of that state because it, under that state, we're not much different than a slave. God tells us we do. That's, a, that's not a relationship with the Father. So verse 7, he says, Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, you are an heir through God. Verse 8, However, at that time, you did not know God. At the time when you're just under the basic principles. At that time, you didn't know God. And because you didn't know Him, you didn't know any better. Your, your judgment wouldn't have been good. You didn't understand how corrupt society was. You didn't understand the dangers that were in the world. And because you didn't understand, He just told you, here's what to do, here's what not to do. That was it. That's how you were at that time. But it says, but now, verse 9, having known God, or rather having been known by God, how is it that you turn back to those weak and powerless elementary things again? Yeah. He just called those basic elements. This is right. This is wrong. That's bad. This is good. Don't do that. Do this. He just called that powerless and weak. And he gave them himself. Now, let's see if, how accurate that is. Let me tell you, how many of you have done what you knew you shouldn't do? Raise your hand. Law didn't stop you, did it? <laughs> Had no power to stop you, did it? And does that fix you? You know you shouldn't be looking at something and you look at it anyway. What are you going to do? Go remind yourself that you shouldn't do it? It didn't stop you the first time. Is it going to fix you the next time? You got a problem in your life and, the pro and you know the problem is because the basic elements tell you that's bad. Now this is good. You're doing it anyway. Even Paul, a devout Jew. Remember what he said in Romans 7? Oh, I delight in the law of God in my mind. I agree with the law. I want the things that the law said to do. I wanted to do, but I ended up not doing them. And the things the law said that I shouldn't do, I didn't want to do, but I ended up doing them. And what did he say? He said, man, I discovered that there was some other law in me, a law of sin in my members, making me a prisoner of the law of sin and death. And then you know what he said? Oh, wretched man that I am. And that's the state that we're in if we're simply living under, you should do this and you shouldn't do that and don't do this and don't do that. Now, we may have heard it as thou shalt not and thou shalt. Those are just basic elements that's just to keep us accountable that's just to keep us under but we live like that we're no different than a slave and God has something better for us than that he sent forth his son so that we could be brought out of that situation and brought into a status of actually becoming a stated son. But what does it take to do that? If you want to follow him, turn to Romans 8. Romans 8. Verse 14. We'll start in verse 14. Romans 8, 14. For as many 
as are being led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And here the Greek word is not napios, not the untrained ones. They're the weos, the very first word of weos thesis, the stated sons. When God wants to bring us out of living under the basic principles of thou shalt not and thou shalt, what he does is he sends forth his spirit. And his spirit enters into us. And his, when his spirit enters into us, we become sons, trained sons of the living God, led by his spirit, no longer living under thou shalt not and thou shalt, that's good, that's bad. Those things, those basic principles weren't living. They could tell us what to do, but they were weak, weak and beggarly. Paul also said in, the, in Romans chapter 8, back up if you're in that same chapter, back up to verse 3. Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh. Now, why was the law weak to the flesh? What dwelt in our flesh that caused us so many problems? Sin. And with sin dwelling in the flesh, there's no way we could keep the law. It wasn't designed to fix us. It was designed to kind of keep us in check, but it was powerless. All of us know that knowing what's right and wrong doesn't stop us from doing it. How many of us have stolen in our lifetime? Didn't you know you weren't supposed to steal? You were under those basic elements. Didn't, you knew it was wrong when you did it, right? Didn't stop you. So what, thinking about not stealing, is that gonna stop you the next time? No. Something else needs to happen because the law is weak to the flesh, but what the law could not do, God did in sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And he, as a sin offering, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So what happens when the spirit of God comes into us? What's the change? It, we're changed from an infant into a son. You know why? Because the spirit of his son, the spirit of Christ, the divine nature, God's own ability, God's own fullness enters into our spirit. And that's what enables us to live as sons because now we're not living under what you should do and what you shouldn't do. This is good and this is bad. Now, God begins to work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And his spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ himself, his nature, his mind, his heart, brings in us something we did not have. It brings us ability, power. He, Jesus told his disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive poder, power. You will receive my ability and my ability will do what the law was never able to do. How, how does the Spirit of God do what the law is not able to do. Well, let's look. And if you're still in Romans, Romans chapter 8, and it actually said this also in Galatians chapter 4. Let's look and read the passage again. Back in Romans chapter 8. I'm going to start again in verse 14, but this time I'm going to read all of verse 15. Verse 14, but as many as are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You know what the fear was caused? You know what the spirit of fear was caused? Because every single one of us knows the law is right. <laughs> and you know when you break the law, you're guilty. And you know guilt, being guilty of breaking the law means punishment. And that's what you were afraid of. And you knew that. But that's not the spirit you've received again. He redeemed you from out of that. 
to bring you into something else. What did he want to bring you into? You've, been, you've not received the spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out. What do we cry out? Abba, Abba Father. Abba was, what, was what, the, what the little child said when they wanted Daddy to pick them up. Abba. Abba. Pick me up. It's what happens in the heart that brings power to do what all the law of basic thou shalt and thou shalt not does not have power to do. What is the power that the Spirit brings? It's the powerful love of Christ for His Father. When the Holy Spirit comes in, the love of Jesus for His Father enters us. You know what set Jesus apart from us? His perfect love for His Father. That's the secret He walked in. That's why He could say, I don't say what, what I want to say. I only say what my Father tells me to say. I don't do whatever I want to do. I only do what my Father tells me to do and my yoke is easy and my burden is light why because i love my father and he told the word he says the world needs to learn that i love the father and i always do what he says so what is the power that the holy spirit brings into us when the very spirit of jesus christ comes to live in us it brings the same love for the father that Jesus himself had. And look at this in Romans chapter 5. I'll show you. Romans chapter 5. Go back there with me. I'll start right from the very first of the chapter. There's not too many verses to read. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. But not only this, we also boast in our afflictions. Knowing that our afflictions brings about perseverance. And perseverance brings about proven character. And proven character brings about hope. And hope does not put to shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So what does the Holy Spirit fill our hearts with? That the law did not have. The Holy Spirit fills our heart. With the love for the Father. A perfect love. And when our hearts are filled with this love for the Father. We take on the same spirit of Jesus. Jesus said for lo it's written about me in the volume of the book. I delight to do thy will. It's a privilege. When, when we love our Heavenly Father and the love of God is filling our hearts, you know what it produces? It produces a joyful obedience to the Heavenly Father. We don't see His laws as restrictive. We don't, see the, we don't think He's trying to take anything from us. We understand it's a perfect law of liberty. God is trying to save us from the effects of society. He's trying to save us from the toxic culture we're in. He's trying to save us from the trap of living your life driven by self-gratification. And it brings into us a power, an eternal power, the very nature of Jesus who did everything he did through the love of his Father. And this is what Jesus prayed for us. Look, turn with me if you have your Bibles. John 17. This is what he prayed that we would experience in John 17. I'm going to start uh, verse 20. And this is specifically about us because in verse 20, Jesus says, I do not ask in behalf of these, meaning his disciples who were right with him alone, he says, but, but for those who will believe in me through their word. Well, that's us. We're the ones who are believing in Jesus through the word of the apostles. That's us. Let's see what he prayed for us. 
verse 21. This is what Jesus prayed for us. That they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, Jesus and the Father were one. That means Jesus never disagreed with a single thing his Father said. Amen. That means Jesus thought his Father was perfect in every way. And every word the Father speaks is healing and help and goodness and kindness and love and mercy to us. And when we are one, as Jesus was one in the Father, that's the way we think. And now there's an ability to walk in it because we're free. The, the weight of sin is that crippled, corrupt mind that somehow thinks God is withholding from us. That somehow thinks that the way of the Lord is hard. Uh-uh. When the love of God is filling the heart, it is a delight to do His will. Amen. And this, this heart takes the filling of the Holy Spirit in us. When we are being filled with the Holy Spirit, Isaiah describes it as this. Suddenly, you mount up like an eagle. Carried, he just spreads his wings and he's not having to flap. The power of the air current literally lifts him up. And when the, the love of God is filling our hearts, suddenly we are lifted up from the weight of sin and it becomes freedom to do the will of God. It becomes a delight to serve God because the love of God is filling our hearts and we are desiring to please the Heavenly Father. We're living by a desire that's greater than that old desire of self-gratification, which never did us any favors but only leads us to abuses and addictions and corruptions and takes more from us than it had ever done for us. Let's look, look at something in 1 John. John understood this. The Apostle Jesus loved. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to be in chapter 3 and chapter 4 just a little bit, both of them. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God, and, and we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it does not know Him. This is something the world cannot relate to. The world cannot relate to that the reason I do what I do is because of how much I love the Father. They don't, they don't get it. That's why I do what I do. I don't do it because of this, that, and thou shalt not, and thou shalt, and this is good, and that's bad. No, no, no. That's the way the world lives. They're under that. I'm driven by a desire to please my Father. Amen. Something they can't even, they don't even understand. They haven't tasted it. They, they do not know how beautiful my Father is. They don't know how good my Heavenly Father is. They don't know how great and how kind He is. They are stinking out there searching for emptiness in all their vanities. And they'll never find it. I have found the source of the perfect wisdom, the perfect heart, and that is my Father. And when that, uh, that's something the world doesn't know. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it hasn't been manifest yet what we will be. But we do know this, when He comes, when He's manifested, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. You know, that's my desire. I want to be like my father and look what it says verse 3 and everyone who has this hope fixed on him what does he do he purifies himself why my father's pure my father's pure from selfishness my father's pure from evil my father has none of that toxic element that evil that's in this world and in this culture my Father is pure. And I'm driven by His Spirit in me 
to be pure like him. It's almost like the salmon who's been born in that stream up in a mountain. After three years in the ocean, it's about two to three years in the ocean, something happens to that salmon. And he's instinct. He comes and he swims near the shoreline where the, where the rivers are emptying into the, along the sea, along the coast. And that salmon has been given an ability by God to smell even in the millions of parts. He can smell some of that original water where he was born. And that awakens in him a drive. He knows where he's following a scent and he's being driven back home and he will literally kill himself to try to get there. The Spirit of God in me has poured out the love of God in my heart. And I am tasting the goodness and the love of my Heavenly Father. And it's driving me to be like Him. And everyone with that kind of hope purifies himself as he is pure. Now, so chapter 4. There's some verses in chapter 4 of verse John. Let's look at 1 John 4. Verses 15 through about uh, 18. Right there. We'll start. 1 John 4, 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. How does God abide in us? By the Holy Spirit. The very nature of God. God is love. So God's spirit is love. So what does it mean when the love of God is being poured out into our heart? God is pouring his own person, his own nature into us. His divine love that he is, is being poured into us. That's what's happening. God abides in us. Verse 16, and we have come to know and believed in the love which God has now, this is very important. In us. Does your version say for us? To mistranslation. We have come to believe and know the love that God has in us. See, the apostles knew. They were Jews. They had lived for years and years under the law. And the law never was able to make them righteous. Not until the Spirit of God came to live in them and begin to fill their hearts with the very same love that Jesus had for his father. When they begin to be filled with that love, that's what they begin to rely on. They begin to rely on the love that God had in them, in us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And by this Love has been perfected with us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Do you, would you like to have confidence in the day of judgment? Well, let me tell you, we'll, we'll never give you confidence in the day of judgment. You will never have confidence in the day of judgment by consciousness of the law. Because consciousness of what you should do and what you shouldn't do, that this is right and that is wrong, you know, what that, you know what that does for you? It produces fear. Because you know you don't match up. You don't get it. You know there's fear has to do with punishment. And it's punishment for breaking the law. And so the man who's living that way, afraid of what God is going to do because he keeps breaking the law, that man has not been made perfect in love. And he's still under that weak and miserable relationship. He's, even though he's a son of God, he's no different than a slave. He's not experiencing the real power and ability of the love of God being shed or brought in his heart by the Holy Spirit. Where it's suddenly, by the love of God filling us, God is now at work in us both to do and to will of His good pleasure. Suddenly, it becomes a delight. Because you know what the love of God produces? John said it this way, This is love for God, to obey His commandments. Are you having difficulty obeying? What are you going to do? Go back to the law and read it again? Is that going to help? 
Go back and read the commandments again. Go back and read the Ten Commandments again. If you've been stealing, read that commandment again. That's going to help, right? No, it's not going to help. You already know it. It hasn't helped. What the law could not do, God has done. What has He done? Not only did He take the law in Himself and, and, and put it to death in His body on the tree, but He sent the very Spirit of His Son into our hearts to produce in us the very same love for the Father that Jesus had so that you and I could be one with the Father like Jesus and, the, and, and experiencing the love of God being poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit produces in us the ability to obey. Amen. Joyfully. Freely. You want to see it? Jesus actually talked about this with the disciples. John 14. Turn back to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, verse 14. Excuse me, chapter 14. John 14. I'm going to start with uh, verse 21. Jesus makes this clear to his disciples. Uh, <clears throat> I'll back up to verse 19 to kind of get us into the context. John 14, verse 19. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, and because I live, you will live also. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. You know what that means? We are, we are, and that day, what we're going to know is we are in that relationship. We are one with the Father. This, we are in a new status altogether. We're not just under the laws of the basic element of do this and don't do that. No, no. We, God, we are in the relationship. God is our Father. We have His Spirit. We share His nature. And, and Jesus goes on to say, verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Then Judas, not, not Judas Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, and think about this answer with me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our dwelling with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. Okay, do you follow that? What, they're asking him, Jesus, why, why are you being so clear to us, but the world, the world doesn't understand this? He answered, remember his answer? He who loves me, he will keep my word. But the one who does not love me, he's not going to keep my word. Oh, Do you or I have a struggle obeying? Do we have a struggle obeying? You know, what it is? you know what the problem is? It's not that we don't understand the law. We have a love problem. We are not being filled with the spirit of love. We, we're, we're not being perfected in love. Because love, when love is there, let me tell you, let me, let me kind of explain it to you this way. Without love, you're not going to relate to the commandment in the same way. Jesus said this, the world needs to learn that the Son loves the Father and always does what He says. <laughs> and it was Jesus' delight to do His Father's will. That's why He said, my yoke is easy. I get to do what I enjoy doing. When the love of God is filling your heart, your attitude towards the words of God, you treasure them, you value them. They are your counsel. They are your instructions. They are your guide. They are no longer a law to you. They are life. They are spirit and life to you. Um, let me give you an example. How many of us have said, I know I have, so you don't, you're not, don't, be, don't be ashamed to raise your hand. How many of us said, I need more patience? <laughs> yeah. So what do you do? How do you, how do you get more patience? By studying again the law? Yep, you should be patient. Yep, I need to be patient. I need to be patient. 
I need to be patient. Has it ever helped telling yourself you need more patience? Listen to this. Love is patient. That's what love is. That's what love does. When you're not patient with someone, you lack love. You need to be filled with love. Because when you get filled with love, you will be patient. How many of you said, I need to be kind? I need to stop being so, I need to be kind. Yeah. The reason you're not kind is because you're not filled with love. Because love is kind. That's what love does. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. Love is the very nature of God. And when you're filled with love, you're abiding in God and God is abiding in you. And when God is abiding in you and love is abiding in you, you will start doing what God is enabling you to do. And it's not because you're under the law and it's not because you know what you're supposed to be doing. It's because you're being filled with the Spirit of God and he, the love of God is being shed abroad into your heart. And it's producing fruit. Fruit. You, you find yourself doing what love compels you to do. There's a new power in your life. It is the very love of God in your life welling up, changing your entire relationship with God. You no longer see him as the judge that you're going to stand before. Which causes you to do what? Kind of tremble a little bit, right? Because you know. No, no. That's a necessary part. That's a protection for us when we don't understand. And for, for a while, all of us, when we were untrained... All of us lived under the protection of that kind of guardian. But God doesn't want you to stay there, does He? God wants the same relationship with you and I that He enjoyed with His Son. He wants a heart that delights to do His will. Freedom. He wants you to be filled with understanding. He wants you to understand his goodness. Here's the danger we face in our day. This is the danger. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the last days are going to be pretty difficult. Lots of false prophets, many are going to be deceived. All kinds of things going on in the world. But he, here's what he warns us about. He said that lawlessness is going to be multiplied. It's just. And lawlessness is basically the whole world saying, I don't care about the basic principles. I don't care about this is bad and that's right and that's wrong. And I just don't care. That's and can you see that happening around? But here's what happens when lawlessness begins to be multiplied. The effect is the love of the many starts to grow cold. What love is he talking about? The love for God. That's the whole power. That's, that's the only a genuine ability to live a life that's pleasing to God is when you're being filled with the love of God. It's like the old steam engine. If there's no fire in the belly, the train slows down. There's no power. You have to, if you want more power, more speed, you, you, heat, up the, you heat up the belly of the, the train and off it will go. When the love of God begins to cool in the life of a believer. They lose power. And when you lose power to overcome the law of gravity, what happens if a plane loses power? Gravity sucks it right back down. And if it does not regain power, there's going to be a terrible crash landing. To lose the fire of the love of God in our heart is a great danger. Do you remember the church of Ephesus? Yes. There were seven churches in Revelation. 
Jesus spoke to them. The church at Ephesus was the first church he spoke to. This is when John the Apostle had the, the revelation on the Isle of Patmos. And Jesus used him to send a message to this church of Ephesus. Well, this church of Ephesus, by our standards today, would have been pretty decent. They were pretty strict. They were faithful to what they knew. They were, they, they, they were still doing a lot. They still had a lot of outreach and ministry. They, a lot was going on. But Jesus said to them through John, I've got this one thing against you. Yes. You have left your first love. Ooh. He knew that the, that the fire had begun to cool. That's what he knew. He knew what was going to happen. And he said to, he had to say to them, he had to tell them, remember the height from which you've fallen. So what's the height? It's when you were in your first love. You see? When because when you're when you're in your first love, it's every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Yes. Jesus saves and keeps me. He's the one I'm living for. That's first love. That's he's a delight to my soul. Yes. That I love to spend time with him. That is not living under the law. That's not trying to just do what's right. That is living by the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit shedding abroad the love of God into our hearts. Amen. It's a whole different way to live. And that's what God is calling us to. It's a good thing to know what's right and wrong. That's good. That's good. That'll keep you from doing a lot of stupid things. <laughs> but that's not what God wants. God, what does God want? He wants your heart. He wants you to know how good He is. He wants you in the very same relationship He had with Jesus. So He can pour out His Spirit in you. Shed abroad His love into your heart. And when His love is being shed abroad in your heart, the natural response is, you do the will of God. You obey the voice of God. You love the presence of God. You're His Son. And, and, you, and there's nothing to fear in the day of judgment because you know you're living the very same way Jesus did. He loved his father and did what his father said. That's how you live because that's what he wants. And you have nothing, when you think about the day of judgment, the only thing you think about is I cannot wait to see him because you already love him now. Yes. You see, that's where we need to be. That's that place the Lord desires to get us to be. And so, let me just ask you today. Is that where you are? Are you there? Listen, it's not a bad place to have those basic principles in your life. To know what's right and wrong. That's good. To, but that's not, where, that's not freedom. That's not where the fullness of life is. That's not being perfected in love. That's not seeing the Lord Jesus fully formed in you. That's not being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when you are being filled with the Holy Spirit and when the love of God is being shed or brought into your heart, it's a delight. Hmm. It's a delight. You know, it's that song. Uh, oh, how sweet to walk. In this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Now, I don't want you to be discouraged. I see this so clearly. Sometimes, and I, I get this, this is where I get in trouble sometimes. I would like to you to see it fully right now. And you know how we can do that. We can walk over to the wall when it's dark and we can... Flip the light on an instant light. But that's not how God brings light, is it? Think about it. I was driving yesterday back from Beaumont. 
So I was, I was, I was going west because Beaumont East side of Houston and we're west of Houston. And, but it was, we left at uh, about 3.30 in the morning, so it was fully dark. And as we were kind of getting the other side of Houston, in between San Antonio and Houston, just the, the faintest little bit of, you can hardly see it changing. Just suddenly it's not as dark. And it just, it's just so quiet. Just keep driving and just, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more light. A little bit more light. Let me explain something to you. That's how this revelation will come to you. You've got to keep walking in the light. It's not like you can just, oh, Brother Allen shared about this today. Turn the light on and now I see. No, 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 no. God is the one who gives light. And it will dawn on you very gradually. And as it dawns on you, and you see it clearer and clearer, you know what happens when you see the light more clear? Oh, you see all those things you've been stumbling over. <laughs> Amen. You're like, oh, I don't have to trip over that anymore. That's what that was. Okay? So, let me encourage you. Don't be discouraged. Walk in the light. Trust the process. And ask the Father... And this is what you know if you you know if you ask anything according to your to his will, you know that he hears you, right? You know that. You know it's his desire for you to be one with him like Jesus was one with him. Then you ask him to do that in you. Ask him to fill you with your, his Holy Spirit so that you think of him just like Jesus did. Perfect. Not a single disagreement. Agreement and every single point in what a delight. Now, will you still experience some other weird stuff? Yes. Yeah. But where are they coming from? Where is the weird stuff coming from? Your flesh. That's not the Father. Don't let that trouble you. And you know what? Remember, remember what is not effective to the flesh. Remember what the flesh does not care about? The flesh doesn't care about the basic principles, does it? The flesh doesn't care about, you shouldn't do that. The flesh doesn't care about, that's wrong. Well, the flesh will walk right over it. Just like a bull doesn't care about a fence. When that, when that cow on the other side is in heat, that bull is going to go right through that fence. The, flesh, the, the, the law is not an answer to your flesh. It's being filled with the love of Christ. Yes. It's, it's receiving power from the Spirit. And then you'll discover what Paul said. Those who are led by the Spirit, they do not fulfill the desires of the flesh. They're being filled with the love of God. And the love of God is, is producing in them an ability to delight in the way of God that they never knew while they were living under the basic principles. You got it? All right.